come in. We will get started here in just a moment. Thank you for being here. Morning, Dave. Good morning, Dave. Just give everybody a couple more minutes. Dave Martin. Dave Martin was our very first Cloud Voice customer. So thank you, Dave. All the way back in the dark ages, huh? All the way back in the dark ages. <laughs> Good morning, Laura. <laughs> Good morning, All right, Laura. give about another 30 seconds or so and we'll get going, everybody. I appreciate you being here. All right, Sean, I think we're good here. All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're excited to have you and to dive into this uh, webinar, Cybersecurity 101, what business leaders need to know about the current cyber threat landscape. Uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. If you have questions, feel free to submit them in the chat at any point. We'll be doing a little bit of a Q&A session here towards the end, and we'll make sure that we can get it all answered for you. Uh, just real quick, I am Taylor Clark, Director of Marketing for Intellicom. Uh, just be here to introduce you to your hosts. So first, I'll introduce Sean Torres, CEO of Intellicom. I'm sure many of you in here have gotten a chance to meet us or meet him. He'll be uh, joining us towards the end for our Q&A session. Um, and then finally, I am happy to introduce Natalie Suarez. She's a Principal Solutions Advisor with ConnectWise. They are our partners in crime, so to speak, when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, so I will go ahead and pass this off to Natalie. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you for having me. Um, first of all, we're not really in a cyber crime organization, so let's just clarify that. <laughs> I do um, have a technical background. I started my career as a software developer and really have supported intelligence analysts all my life, first for the US government and now for a uh, cybersecurity analyst. Um, super passionate about a few things, my family, threat intelligence and Lego, Lego in the middle there, and not necessarily in that order. So let's go ahead and dive into this. So the reason we're here is because times have changed. Uh, and this is a perfect example of how times have changed. You know, back in the 80s or the 90s, we never got in strangers' cars. Then with the advent of the internet for the masses in the 90s, uh, we didn't meet people on the internet. It wasn't considered safe. And now, um, you know, starting in the 2000s, we literally summoned strangers from the internet using this little device which was, is more powerful than any computer I owned back in the 90s, and get in their cars via Uber or Lyft or what have you. And most of the time, it turns out pretty well for us. So we're going to talk about today, uh, what is cybersecurity exactly? What do we mean when we say cybersecurity? I think it's one of those words that we hear so often that maybe it's lost some of its meaning. Then I'm gonna go into some of the cyber concerns that small and medium-sized businesses should have. And we're gonna talk about EDR and MDR. And don't worry so much about these acronyms right now. I will explain them. We love our acronyms in cybersecurity. Then I'm going to dive into zero trust. We're gonna talk about people, process, and technology. We'll talk about risk and responsibility, and then I'm going to drive it all home with a cybersecurity analogy so you can remember some of what I said today. So what exactly is cybersecurity? Uh, many of you may be familiar with Gartner as you are in the business world. And um, if you're not, you can simply think of them as a think tank. Uh, they categorize different types of software, different industries, including cybersecurity. And this is their textbook definition of cybersecurity. And while I do agree on some of these points, it's definitely about technology processes and practices, right? And it definitely is protecting um, 
from attack, you know, or damage or unauthorized access. But is that really the modern day or the current definition of cybersecurity? And I would say no, it is not. So cybersecurity is really about managing risk. We understand we are in the business of cybersecurity. That makes it forefront in our mind. You are in business for whatever your business is, whether you're a government contractor, whether you're healthcare, whether you're financial, manufacturing, you are in business to do what you do. But you do have to manage your risk so you could stay in business. Um, we understand that security is a cost center, cost center for you, and it only makes sense to the extent that it reduces your business risk or saves you money. So what are some of the concerns that small to medium sized businesses have or should have right now? Well, we understand um, there are some challenges. Like I said earlier, you're not in the business of cybersecurity. You're in the business of what you set your business up to do. So there's confusion around cyber. People think of it as an IT challenge. While IT is involved and they deploy technical solutions, cybersecurity is really a business challenge. It's all about how do you manage your risk and your risk tolerance in combination with your business objectives? And we understand that you have competing priorities. We understand because we felt it ourselves the complexity of protecting our own environments due to this shift to a remote workforce, whether you're fully remote or you're hybrid or even, you know, adding infrastructure to the cloud versus having it all in house. Like in the good old days, we had these big server rooms and these horrible wiring racks. And now we still may have some of those horrible wiring racks, but we have a lot, moved a lot to AWS or Office 365, Microsoft 365 or Google, et cetera. Maybe you don't have anyone who is a cyber professional in your organization. Um, so you really have to rely on somebody else to help you with that. And that's why we're doing this webinar here with Intelecom as our partner. They should be your trusted advisor because they understand cybersecurity and they can help you form a plan that makes sense for you. You may not have formal um, back, backup uh, business continuity and disaster recovery, which includes backup efforts. Um, and the cost, the cost of everything is rising nowadays, and it doesn't change with cyber. The cost for responding and recovering from an incident has risen, and even protecting yourself from an incident has risen, because unfortunately, times have changed. And as the bad guys get smarter and they come up with more challenging ways to test us, we have to come up with smarter ways to defend and prevent attacks in our environments. There's been a lot of global legislation a lot of le legislation here in the U.S. Did you know that privacy legislation considers in, I would say, at least 99% of cases, I haven't found one yet that doesn't, it applies to where your clients are, not where your business is located. So if you're doing business overseas in the U.K., you have to pay attention to GDPR. If you're doing business in the state I live in, in Florida, I know you guys aren't in Florida, um, you have to pay attention to those laws, though we don't have many privacy laws here in the state of Florida. Cyber warfare. Um, think of, I listened to a podcast this morning where they were talking about, you know, eventually this war between Russia and Ukraine is going to be over. And kind of the examples of what happens when there's no repatriation of forces. This is the first time we've really had a war that has had cyber forces. How do you repatriate those? How do you take away or recollect the tools they're using in today's effort and return them to society as productive citizens? And then, of course, the biggest one for most of you, I would imagine, is reputation damage. It can be very crippling for a small to medium sized business to have a cyber attack. Unfortunately, you are targets. And there's many reasons for this. Um, all organizations, that's from the enterprise all the way down to the smallest one to two person um, medical office or dental office or CPA firm or law firm or whatever, you're all being targeted by financially motivated actors. Now, some of the reasons are, again, times have changed. In the past, they were going after the big fish because they saw the big payday. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how times have changed, give you some examples in here. But now they could do something we call pray, um, spray and pray. 
So everything's automated. They can automate the attacks. They could cast a very wide net and hope to get a fair a couple of really good fish, which unfortunately could be you. Um, scary stat. This does, um, I do provide references for every stat that I share with you. Uh, feel free to call me out in the Q&A. If I missed one, I will get that uh, for you. And by the way, if you have any questions while I'm presenting, I know none of you can speak right now, but if you put them in the Q&A, we'll, we'll respond at the end. So don't feel bad about putting those in while they're top of your mind. So a new ransomware attack does occur about every 11 seconds. Some of my sources say it's a little bit quicker than that, but I figure 11 seconds is bad enough, right? So this is one of the reasons why um, organized crime or threat actors, as we call them, can come after you. So there is this concept of ransomware as a service, phishing as a service, whatever attack you want to call as a service. And so bad threat actors, like let me give you an example. One of them is Lockbit. You may have actually heard of Lockbit in the news. And um, they are gangs, organized crime, okay? And um, they um, actually have the people on staff who have the network knowledge, who have the software knowledge to create a ransomware as a service attack or a phishing attack or anything like that. <clears throat> and although they were making great money on their own doing this, excuse me one moment. Um, they decided, why should I only make money directly by attacking? We're so successful. How about if we set up a business and we offer our service to affiliates, they call threat actors who purchase from them, their affiliates, and allow our affiliates to use our hard intellectual property and use it to make a portion of money for us and a portion of money for them. So that's where this as a service comes. Now, um, unlike in the good old days when you had to know about networks, you had to know how to write software, you could just go to the dark web using a browser called a Tor browser. That's the Onion Router. And any one of us can do this, can download this and, and access the dark web. I don't recommend it if you're faint of heart because you will see lots of things for sale that you just cannot unsee. But what happens is these affiliates come to the dark web marketplace, kind of like your Amazon web, you know, your Amazon marketplace, and they pick and choose what they want. They pay for it with crypto. And then the um, the purveyor or the organization like Lockbit, what they do is they'll split uh, the spoils with them, maybe 60, 40, maybe 50, 50, who knows? Um, I'm sure somebody knows. I don't recall right now. Um, so what happens is now Lockbit provides YouTube videos. They provide a help desk. They provide payment processing, really everything you need to be a bad guy or a threat actor. And unfortunately for us, even if you pay the ransom, your chances of getting everything restored are very slim. Um, on average, 61% of data is restored after paying the ransom. That is actually down from 65% the previous year. I'm using a 2023 Sophos report. And if you look at that report, it's reporting on 2022 data. And only 4% of companies get everything back. That is really low. And that is down from 8%. So that's a drastic drop. So let me share. I think I've mentioned some of these. These are some of the industries consistently under attack. Finance, healthcare, construction, legal, manufacturing, education. Education was a huge one last year. Manufacturing is, is more and more every year, including uh, IoT, Internet of Things, maybe their SCADA networks, uh, industrial control systems. But bad news, if you're not on this list, it does not mean you are exempt from attacks. Remember I said spray and pray? That means we're casting a wide net to catch as many as we can. So here's some information, some news stories uh, that I took to share with you about some of the current things that are going on. Um, I wanted to let you know um, some of these. You may be wondering, why is she showing me Facebook? or chat GPT, these are huge corporations. US Energy Department is a huge corporation. 
but you know, don't you use energy for your business? Um, and notice the one in the upper right hand corner. This is what I was just telling you about ransomware as a service. I just want to show you this is a recent article about the cybercrime ecosystem I was just telling you about. Um, insurance, Lloyd's to forbid insurers from covering losses due to state back hacks. How do you prove it wasn't a state actor? Well, not only are some of these tools that we believe can protect you from these hackers, but some of these tools can actually be used to kind of dig you out of that hole. So for instance, here at ConnectWise, we had a client in healthcare and this client, um, as many of you probably know, HIPAA is a regulation that um, puts strict regulations on the monitoring of PHI, personal health information. Well, this particular client was a healthcare uh, practitioner and they did have someone who broke into their system, right? But because they had an endpoint detection and response, which monitors their workstation or laptop, and because they had a security information and event management system, which looks at their wider network infrastructure, including their cloud services, they were able to prove through those that this attacker never gained access to any PHI. So if you're under any kind of compliance regulations or, you know, the federal government would like not just critical infrastructure, but any business to, to report when um, these kind of breaches happen, we were able to prove that the attacker never accessed any of that PHI. Therefore, they didn't have to pay any fines to the US government, and it wasn't published all over the Health and Human Services website. So not only do these tools help protect your environment, they can also help protect your reputation because they didn't have a reportable incident, they didn't pay any additional fines, and they didn't show up in the public record as having a breach. Um, other ones you should worry about, Facebook, why should you worry about a large corporation like Facebook or even Meta? Well, unfortunately, I am willing to bet that many of your staff and colleagues are using the same email address that they use for their professional services or for logging into Facebook, logging into Amazon, logging into ChatGPT. And all those major players I just mentioned have had one or more breaches, Amazon other shopping services. There's a lot of shopping services now coming out from China, Timu, Shein or Shane or Shine or whatever you want to call it, many of them. And you know, if you're using those credentials there, um, when they buy your credentials off the dark web, they're going to spray and pray and they're going to go after those domains that are in that website address. So like mine, Natalie at connectwise.com. If I was using that for Facebook and I was compromised, they would purposely try to go to connectwise.com to see if they could break into my account, for instance. ChatGPT was breached, but even beyond that, ChatGPT does have protections in it to prevent people from doing bad things with it. So even though they say I really can't get write good malware with it, I would argue that I probably could because I can ask it things like, how do I access the APIs of the Amazon Web Services or that Amazon S3 bucket that's holding all this great data that I really wanna uh, get to. And I can disguise my real intentions. As a matter of fact, I disguised my real intentions with ChatGPT and created four phishing emails in less than two minutes by telling it I was actually um, using it to create a uh, security awareness training. And look at the bottom middle here, Worm GPT. This is a nefarious or bad use of something like ChatGPT. Look at the Move It breach. Uh, the statistics that I was looking at say that more than 15 million people have been affected. I'm not talking about the businesses. I'm talking about the individuals who do business with those organizations were affected by it. And I could just go on and on here, but I will. I will. I promise. I will move ahead. Um, so at ConnectWise, we have a security operations center that works within telecom. And in our security operations center, there's a few things that really set us apart. Um, one of those is we have very low turnover in our security operations center. They're also very highly credentialed. And when I say they're highly credentialed, I'm not talking about those credentials and we all know which ones those are, that you only have to be a good test taker to get those little initials behind your name. These credentials are 
test of their actual ability to do their job. Some of these tests can be days long and some of them didn't even pass on the first try. These are serious, serious accreditations by something called the GCIA. And if you'd like to hear more about that, happy to share that with you. Um, now they're super smart. And out of those super smart people, we have a really elite group called the Cyber Research Unit. And why should you care about our Cyber Research Unit? Well, because they have the coolest job at ConnectWise. No, just kidding. That's not why you should care. That's why I care. Uh, the reason you should care is because these are the smartest of the smart. They spend their days doing things like attracting malware so they can take it detonate it in a safe environment and figure out exactly what it does. And because they could do that and figure out exactly what it does, that means they could put that knowledge back into our software and make our software be able to detect it. Um, they have discovered new threats. They have discovered new threat actors. They are really a great group. And I'm proud to say that they're part of our team. Um, and when I say our team, I mean our team, ConnectWise and Intellicom and they're putting great uh, effort and information into the products. Now, I mentioned Lockbit earlier, and here I just wanna share with you real quick that these are some of the top five groups that we're seeing, that our cyber research unit is seeing and our SOC is seeing across our client base. And these are the TTPs that all groups use. TTPs, what are those? Well, the only people that like acronyms more than cybersecurity professionals are military professionals. So that is actually a military term. It stands for tactics, techniques, and procedures. And the reason I'm showing you this is every single last tactic, technique, and procedure in this list can be detected and stopped at some point by an endpoint detection and response and or a security information and event management system. Now, I'm not telling you if you have those two technologies, there's no way they can get in. I'm telling you it can be detected. At what point it will be detected depends on other factors, which we'll talk about in a minute. But these technologies can protect you and help you thwart these type of attacks and minimize the time the bad guy has to be in your environment and do bad things. If any. If any vendor or any uh, technology service provider, managed security service provider, anyone ever tells you if you do A, B, and C, you're 100% protected, I'm here to tell you right now, and I know Intellicom would agree with me, they are not telling you the truth. Because it's very, um, this is why you need people like the Security Operations Center. These guys are just as smart as them, they're very crafty, and they're always thinking of new ways to do damage. So I just wanted to show you a couple of examples of some attacks. If you take a look at these two uh, phishing emails, you'll see they look really real. This is one of the reasons why you should never click on anything from an email. If you get an email from Office 365 or now Microsoft 365, or you get an email from any software vendor that you use or anyone, you should always do a couple things. You should always if you get one from Microsoft 365, you know how to get to your Microsoft 365 account. Don't follow the link in the email. Go directly to your account, change your password there. The worst that could happen to you if you do that is you change your password for no reason. If you click on a phishing email and change your password, the worst that could happen is that you can give away the keys to the kingdom and you can be dealing with a breach incident. And a breach is a legal term, so please don't use that term lightly. This are, these are real screenshots from our Security Operations Center. This is another tip to look for or to avoid. So these are OneNote documents that were sent as attachments. Now let's stop and think about this for a moment. Sometimes all you have to do is slow down and think. OneNote is made for collaboration. So why would someone not just invite me to collaborate with them? Why would they send me a OneNote attachment? That should be your first clue that something is wrong. Um, so, but if that didn't clue you, remember what I said about never clicking on anything? These look really real. But if you were to click on any of these, like I said, these are real items that we saw happen to our clients. If you were to click on any of these, you would be subjected to a ransomware attack. Um, because what happens is they will automatically launch from OneNote uh, something called PowerShell, which allows them to have access to your computer in a way that can be scripted to do whatever they want to do. Now, the good point is, if you have an endpoint detection and response system, this is very good at detecting threats like this. And that's how these threats were detected. Because once someone clicks on that link, 
it is not a normal behavior for one note to launch another process that's going to launch a script that could do anything. So that's something very simple for a endpoint detection and response system to detect, not so much a human. This is another attack. So this one demonstrates the need for something we call defense in depth. So no one technology is going to save your bacon. You need to have a combination. Not only do you need to have a combination of technologies, you also need to have a combination and how, um, and we'll talk about this later, people, process, and technology. It's not all a tech game. Even though I really love the tech part of it, it is definitely um, very important that you ba balance all three of those, people, process, and technology. We'll talk about that later. Let, I know there's a lot of words on this slide, so just look at the slide and listen to what I'm saying, and I'm going to explain to you how this works. So what happens is we have a user. Let's call the user Bob. Bob wants to get, Bob receives an email, okay? This email looks like it came from office.com or portal.office.com, a Microsoft website, right? So remember that never click, go directly to the site. Well, what happens here, we call this an actor in the middle attack or a man in the middle attack. And that is why we have this attacker here in the middle. The hoodie is what clues you to the fact that this is a threat actor. Just kidding. We don't all wear hoodies. Um, though I have one, but I'm more of a nerd than a threat actor. Um, so what happens is the user clicks on this email. First thing happens is the user goes, oh no, I just had security awareness training. I am never ever supposed to click on anything in an email. I should have gone directly to office.com. So, but he's already clicked. So Bob has already clicked. Now, why is that bad? Well, the reason we call this an actor in the middle attack is because we have something called a proxy server. So this proxy server, in very simple terms, is just a server that forwards information from one location to another location, from one server to another server. So this server in the middle right here gets Bob's input. But I want you to look at the bottom of the screen. You see where it says TLS encrypted and those curvy arrows down there? That means all the communications are encrypted. That means the attacker can't read the username and password without decrypting it, which you know does require some effort. But attackers are smart. They don't want to do any effort that they don't have to do. So all they do at this point is they forward that information using their proxy server to the target website. So it forwards the username and password to the target, which is office.com. Office.com then prompts for the multi-factor authentication, which again passes through the proxy server. Now, the phishing site proxies the MFA prompt. So it puts up a prompt saying, give me your MFA. The user goes, well, this all looks normal. So I guess it's really okay to keep going. So they complete the MFA prompt. Still, everything is still encrypted. The phishing site forwards the MFA input to the target website. The target website replies, uh-oh, this is where we have a problem. It says the target site returns the session cookie. So you may ask what a session cookie is. That All you need to know is that session cookie contains everything that threat actor needs to now be you. So now that threat actor is you. They have punched a hole in your defenses and they can log in as you, they can forward emails to everyone in your contacts and get them infected because now if they mouse over that sender address, it's gonna be you, it's gonna be a real address and that's how they propagate this attack. And if you have any questions on that, let me know. That was a layman's explanation that did not include all of the technical detail about proxies, reverse proxies and all that boring stuff that you guys don't wanna hear about. So I'm, I'm betting that some of you have received your cyber insurance renewal or you're looking at cyber insurance. This is just a copy of a real cyber insurance application. And I want you to notice they're asking, do you have ransomware recovery protections? Not only are they asking, do you have this? They're asking, what kind do you have? And they're going to use that as part of this larger application process to decide whether you are an acceptable risk to them and whether or not you're going to get a favorable rate or you're going to get an increased rate because you are a risk they can kind of sort of accept, but you're gonna pay for it. So what is the minimum acceptable technology that you need for cyber insurance to get a good rate? 
Well, remember I said people, process, and technology? Notice number one is a policy. That's part of your processes, an incident response plan. What do we do when? Notice I said when, not if. What do we do when something doesn't go according to plan? Maybe a bad guy gets into our system, Bob in accounting clicks on that phishing email. What are our steps? You don't want to be thinking about those steps when you're having the crisis. You want to plan them out. You want to practice them way before anything bad happens. Multi-factor authentication. You should have multi-factor authentication on everything you can have it on. And I'm talking personally as well as professionally. And yes, I did show you an attack that can be defeated by MFA. Remember I said defense in depth? Defense in depth means multiple protections. So even though um, someone had multi-factor authentication, the attacker got through that way, maybe because you didn't have uh, appropriate security awareness training or Bob was in a rush and wasn't really paying attention. But hopefully you have number three, an endpoint detection and response system, which would catch the fact that an application that is not supposed to be able to launch a script and execute code on your machine has just launched a script that is going to execute bad code on your machine. Number four, a security information and event management system. So you can think of the EDR or the MDR. And by the way, the M in MDR stands for managed. And that's when you add a security operation center those super smart professionals on top of the endpoint detection and response. And you could think of the EDR or the MDR as what monitors your laptop or your workstation and your security information event management system is what monitors your cloud infrastructure like AWS or Azure or uh, your firewall or your, um, <clears throat> your Office 365 and you, in, any local network that you may have. And it also takes in and correlates information from your endpoint detection and response system and then backups. And I'm trying to keep this a simple list. Am I saying do these in this order? No. Um, that is really going to be discussion between you and Intelecom as to what you should do first and how you should get from where you are now to where you should be. And then, oh, by the way, you should have cyber insurance. And if you want cyber insurance and you want a favorable rate, you will have all of these things. So let's talk more about EDR, MDR. Okay, so you don't know what you don't know, right? Kind of sort of Socrates. What Socrates actually says, all I know is that I know nothing. Now, the reason I use this when I'm explaining an EDR is because uh, many people confuse this with AV or antivirus. This is not an antivirus. An antivirus would never detect um, until um, something bad happened. It would never detect that OneNote launched a process. An EDR can detect user behavior. It can watch application behavior. It can have some components of AI or machine learning way beyond what any antivirus should do. Am I saying you should get rid of your antivirus? No, I am not. But I do see a time in the future when maybe that is no longer needed at all because of the strides that we make. Because I know sometimes we get accused of adding more and more complexity to your cyber stack. And that's because we have to adapt to what the threat actors are doing. So I do see a point in the future where some of these technologies completely fall off or more advanced technologies take over some of the features of things like antivirus, et cetera. What is a SIM? Well, a uh, picture, a picture paints a, you know, per picture's worth a thousand words, right? So what a SIM is, is just like I explained, you see on the left, um, the SOC, well, certified threat analysts will look at the data in the SIM. There is a, a web app where the data can be accessed so we can work in conjunction with Intelecom. There's a SIM marketplace, which no is not something else to buy. It is additional features or additional parsing of certain logs that come in. It can monitor your work from home employees. It, like I said, it can monitor cloud integrations. It can look at the logs from workstations and service, network devices, devices and it can have sensors as well, as well that act as an intrusion detection system that can detect intrusions on the network as well. And again, these are very high level, simple explanations. These are not meant to be the end all be all technical explanation because we could do a whole nother webinar on those subjects. Zero trust, you may have heard this thrown around. Zero trust, first of all, is a framework. 
It is not a technology. There are technologies that implement certain aspects of zero trust. And what's the easiest way to explain zero trust? Well, hopefully some of you are at least as old as me. And if you're not, um, ask for this deck for nothing else in this video, because this video is hilarious. Um, so back in the day, um, there were a series of commercials where the Mac guy, who's the super cool young guy on the right there, um, would make fun of the Windows guy, who's the super nerdy kind of suit, stuffy um, Windows guy on the side. So when Windows Vista came out, if you guys can go back in the Wayback Machine and remember that, that's when Windows introduced user access control. And that man in the middle, who looks like a MIB, a man in black, um, and if you don't know that, you should Google that. Those are great movies too. Um, every time the Windows guy or uh, the Mac guy tried to commute with the com communicate with the Windows Vista guy, man in black over there would go, "Hey, are you sure you want to allow this? Are you sure you want to answer this? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure?" That, in the simplest terms, is what zero trust is. It's all about making sure that people have least privilege. That means we don't just get access to all of our data. We get access to certain data as a regular user and certain more critical data. Maybe we have to actually escalate our permissions to access that. Or maybe some people in the business have no need to know at all. And any of my military people know all about need to know. So that is about making sure people are not accessing information that they shouldn't be able to access and it's all about monitoring that access as well. Remember when I promised you about people, process, and technology? Well, we're here. We're going to talk about Bob again. So I know this is a story you're all familiar with because unfortunately it still happens today. So you must have people, process, and technology in order to be protected and defended against threat actors. You must consider all three pillars. All three pillars are equally important. You take away a pillar or two and bad things are going to happen. Let me give you an example. Bob in accounting gets an urgent email from Jen, the CEO. It says, or so he thinks, it's Jen, the CEO. And it says, hey, Bob, we have a vendor. We're way behind on paying them. We owe them, let's just throw a number out there, 100K. Okay? That may be a little high, but it's an even number. So let's play with it. Um, so Bob gets his email and, and Jen says, and oh, by the way, I'm in a meeting, my cell phone is off, do not try to contact me, do not text message me, do not message me in Teams or Slack or whatever it is they use, and their wire transfer information has also changed. So Bob gets this, panics, immediately sends the money to the new um, wire transfer, sends the wire transfer to the new information, and guess what? Number one, the email was not from Jen. It's a it was a phishing email. Number two, um, the reason this happened is maybe one, Bob wasn't trained. Bob did not realize that over a certain threshold, we don't we don't take email direction to send funds, especially if we're not able to contact the person who's made the request, and especially if the wire transfer information has been changed. Also, we failed here as far as process. Bob did not have a process to follow that said those things, right? That said over a certain amount, you must get a verbal or you must see the person and you have to get approval from two people and it must be via uh, a secure communication like the corporate email. So now your company is out 100K. And that's what one example out of many of what can happen if you do not consider people, process, and, te and technology. Let's talk about risk and responsibility. You guys are going to have to listen faster because my time is almost up. So notice, first of all, this is a circle. It is not a line. Nobody's pointing fingers. We're all in this together. But you as a data owner own the liability for your data. That is because you set the budget for protecting that data. Your information technology team is there to come alongside you and deploy any technology you need. And your information security team or your managed security service provider is there to provide risk insight and mitigation information so that you can make those smart decisions about establishing the budget for protecting yourself and your business. It's all about this. What risk level are you willing to accept to protect your most valuable assets? 
This is what a well-designed cyber or defense in depth looks like. And how do we know where to start and where we're going? We do a security assessment. <clears throat> So, but I'm saying a lot of things that may not be first language for you, may require a translator. So I'm gonna translate with a little analogy. So we all have a home, whether that home's an apartment, a condo, an actual house, and we do certain things to protect that home. So we're gonna talk about how we do that, and then we're gonna round it back out, back and link it back to cyber. First of all, we have to identify what we have. We may have family that we wanna protect, pets, collectibles. We may have uh, valuable documents like our marriage license, our passport. We have electronics like our beautiful TVs and our computers. And we have to think about how we identify those. What is most critical? Am I more concerned if my laptop is stolen or my TV? It stinks both ways, right? But if I call my insurance carrier, they're going to get me a better TV because I have replacement value, right? But if my computer is stolen, I may get a better computer, but that is a key to a lot of personal data about me, my finances, and my family. How do we protect this stuff? We have doors, windows, locks, uh, education. If you have children at home, especially teens, you kind of have to educate them on the dangers of social media and how to use it wisely if you're going to allow them to use it. Otherwise, we know teens don't always think things through all the way. I could say that I have firsthand experience there. Yard signs. We love our yard signs here in the U.S. At least we do in Florida. I've seen them other places. ADT, Simply Safe, whatever, you name it. How do we detect if someone gets past our protective defenses? We might have an alarm that goes with that yard sign. We have a motion sensor, a ring doorbell camera, which, oh, by the way, has been breached multiple times as well. A nosy neighbor, neighborhood watch, whatever you want to call it. How do we respond? We may have a guard dog. We may decide that this is beyond our risk tolerance and we may decide to run away, to flee from the situation. We may call the police outside the home or inside the home, depending again on the situation. We may take a baseball bat to protect ourselves. And then let's round it back out to cyber. How do we protect ourselves? How do we recover? We may have a cyber incident response plan. I know personally at home, we have a hurricane response plan because we have to consider that here in Florida. Business continuity and disaster recovery. Um, you may have, I don't know what you have in your part of the country because I don't know where all of you are at, um, but you have some natural disaster, whether it be earthquake, tornado, whatever it is. We have insurance, we have homeowners, we have personal liability. I highly encourage you to have cybersecurity insurance, and I highly encourage you to read any and all policies you have to know exactly what is covered and how. And then emergency equipment, because you know we could have a situation in our business beyond just a, a normal cyber attack. And let me round this out. So when I started as a software developer, I had a boss who would say, perfect is the enemy of done. And notice this is the second philosopher quote in this presentation, which must mean I'm super smart, right? <laughs> and it really is a Voltaire quote, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Why am I saying this? Well, when I was a software developer, the software team, we'd have stupid exercises. So the customer requirement was to access a certain amount amount of data, certain kind of data, like in 30 seconds, right? So we'd be like, well, I can access that in 15. Well, I'm smarter than you because I could access it in five. And the boss would be like, time out. Perfect is the enemy of done. Let's meet the requirements. And then once we've met all the customer requirements, then we make recommendations to them. This would be better if we did this, if we access this piece of data quicker because of this and we're able to do it. And then we do that. So all this to say, Perfect is the enemy of done. The perfect is the enemy of the good in cyber as well. Gave you a lot of information, super overwhelming, but just start somewhere. And you know what? You've got a partner who can help you start in telecom. And with that, thank you for your time. And I am going to turn this back over to my new friend, Sean Torres. Thank you, Natalie. I appreciate you going over that today. A lot of good information there to uh, understand what, what to do in your business, how to do it. Um, there's so many different variables that could call, cause issues um, that are out there. So obviously the number one risk we have, we run into every day is our, is our staff members uh, and the vendors that we let into our environment. Uh, it's been our goal to continue to protect. Uh, obviously as in telecom, you know, we, we cut our teeth uh, in the voice business and getting there 
but it was imperative for us to make sure that we were secure uh, so we didn't get hacked because of the, the you know the client base that we run into and that we work with across the U.S. Uh, so we've just taken our policies and our procedures that we use internally. I guess we eat our own dog food uh, and then put it back out into the market um, to be able to help companies because we we've been there uh, for people to help them remediate. It's it's never fun. Yeah, it's it's huge business interruption. Uh, costs tons of money. You know, obviously myself as a business owner, I, I don't go in business to save money. I go in business to make money. Uh, and I, and, it, and it's my goal every day to mitigate risk. Uh, I'm always a big component when having conversations with other owners, uh, CIOs, CEOs, general managers, whatever it may be about what is a risk tolerance. You know, if technology makes sense in your business, which the majority of us today need technology in order to operate. Uh, whether that be to conduct business with our customers or to conduct business internally with our staff, uh, I would highly recommend to take it serious because it can happen. I've seen a, you know, a five user company uh, get a ransomware attack. Uh, and then I'm told, oh, well, you know, we could just go buy new PCs and connect back to the internet and get operating. Uh, but it's also the image and what that looks like. Uh, it's also your client's information that you're working for. Say you're working for a large organization uh, you know, one client that makes up a majority of your business, you get hacked and now you're dealing with uh, fixing those issues and your reputation can, could, you know, risk losing the customer, which could be detrimental to your business. Uh, we didn't telecom, you know, we, we've won these great awards. Uh, we've been making huge investments in our business uh, and our staff and educating and continuing to learn to make sure that we keep up with the landscape so we can definitely help uh, in many ways. So, you know, feel free to reach out. Uh, we have built a package today called Intellicom Protect that gives you the tools necessary in order for you to be protected. So uh, we've made it easy. Uh, we've put everything in. There's no uh, gimmicks where, oh, you, you got to buy this extra in order to move forward. This will check the boxes when it comes down to your insurance policies. Um, nobody's too big or too small. So don't think that this is something that you shouldn't have internally inside of your environment. You know, we're trying to make it as easy as possible. I've been told from several owners, oh, you know, uh, we don't have the budget for this. It's really not that expensive compared to what a ransomware attack is going to cost you uh, not having the right setup and, and the right things to protect your business uh, moving forward. So I would, again, highly encourage, take it serious. Uh, it's kind of like having health insurance today, right? A lot of us have it. We all pay for it. We don't always agree for it, but without it, uh, we're in a lot of trouble if something does happen to us uh, in our health. So, you know, again, if you take your health serious, I would take this serious inside of your business to ensure that you are protected. Again, if you want to do a, a risk assessment, we have built a system today. Scan this here, uh, register for a risk assessment. We'll send our team in. You know, if you have questions on insurance policies and want us to look at them, you know, uh, it's it's so often that we get into clients' environments and they say, oh, you know, we have a cyber policy. We look at that policy and their policy really doesn't protect them. It protects people that they work with, but not them internally. So what does that look like if you get shut down and you can't operate for 10 to 12 days? Again, it all goes back to the risk that you're willing to tolerate. Uh, I try to look at things in, in a way that if I can tolerate it, it's okay. If not, then I really want to understand, you know, the uh, the outcomes that come into that. So if you have questions, feel free to reach out to myself, our team. Anybody can help answer anything that we, you know, we, we've been through it all. We've been through the education, the classes. Um, we have staff here that have exceptional knowledge in that cyber world. So we're excited. We're, we're glad you came out today. I know we're going to leave it up now for some questions. I saw some flying through as we were going through. So uh, either myself or Natalie will get these answered. But again, thank you again for coming. We appreciate you taking time out of your day uh, to hear what we have to say. We hope you learned something. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just kick this off here. We had a good question come in a little early on from Justin. Uh, how do I protect my company if I have a remote workforce? For example, working from Starbucks Wi-Fi. Um, Either one of y'all, I'm sure, can speak to that one. Yeah, Up to you, I mean, Sean. You want to go first? Yeah, I can definitely take that. You know, obviously okay. with COVID, a lot of our clients' <laughs> workforce went remote, uh, which brought on other challenges, uh, home networks, coffee shops, 
um, you name it, you know, and, and there's so many variables that come into that. Um, I will tell you, you know, there's no way to fully 100% protect you. Uh, education to your staff is critical. So making sure that they understand what to click on, what not to click on, uh, doing internal phishing attempts to make sure that the people that are clicking on things that they shouldn't click on, we can educate that staff. Uh, mm -hmm. Typically today, we're, we're moving that as a function of HR, uh, just like sexual mm -hmm. harassment sits inside of HR. It should be a same function that, that you should adopt uh, as, as a metric inside of your business. Uh, I will tell you, endpoint protection is critical. Uh, Multi-factor authentication, like Natalie said earlier, if you're not using, at minimum, MFA on everything you're doing, uh, I would highly suggest when you get off of this webinar today to go get it. It's not expensive. Um, I'm talking your financial institution, your PC, you know, all of these systems are now offering it. Hulu, Disney Plus, the reason they're offering it is because they are all at risk. And I assure you that none of us have more money than Disney to protect. So uh, I would highly encourage you to at minimum turn on MFA um, and be aware of your surroundings, right? Don't just click on things, uh, hyperlinks that come through. Uh, look at it, slow down a little bit. I know we're all busy in our days and we're, we're flying through things, but again, 100% recommend, you know, that another tool that we use is a, is a product called Threat Locker. It's a zero trust application. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if you do click on something, it's going to recognize that, like Natalie was discussing earlier, PowerShell. Uh, those are things that we don't recognize as non-IT people, but mm -hmm. these are things that can protect you. It does make your processes different inside of your organization, but I will tell you just from my experience in the market and watching what's happening, uh, I would, again, change your processes. That change is good. And again, mm -hmm. it, it can be somewhat of a slowdown, but I will tell you, ransomware is a bigger slowdown than it takes for you to have someone review something that's clicking in a hyperlink that's running and, and let it run. With AI today, those things are changing fast um, and we're able to keep up with that uh, with, the, with the use of AI. So 100%, mm -hmm. those few small tools. But again, if I had to pick one and I had budget for one, I would tell you to use MFA on all your equipment and all your machines, everything, all your software, um, and that, that's how you protect your remote workforce, uh, the best that you can. Yep. I totally agree. People are the weakest link. We, we are the weakest link. Um, uh, the Verizon study, the defense, um, data investigations, uh, breach report states that 75% of breaches are due to a human factor, whether that's someone clicking on a, an email that causes business email compromise, or that is someone who configures something incorrectly. Um, the best thing you could do there, and then I'll follow into the next question, how can you detect a bad link? What you should you look for? You should never click on a link that's not from a trusted source. If you know that I am going to share a file with you, the only way I can share a large file with you is to provide a link. You know it's okay to click on, but you can always call me. You could also mouse over the email sender address and see if it really is me. If you get anything suspicious from me, like you get something from me, and you're not expecting anything, that's when you pick up the phone and call because it could be that I clicked on something that caused you to get an email from me that is legitimate. You just don't go around clicking on stuff. If you get a Dropbox link, go to dropbox.com, log in with your account. If you get an office link, log into office.com, log in with your account. The worst that can happen is you change your password for no reason. What can happen if you click on a link is much worse <laughs> than what can happen the few minutes it takes you to change a password. Yeah, I, I would always be wary with just giving out information. If you end up clicking on a link, which people do, right? Mm -hmm. It's gonna happen. Oh, yeah. It asks you to put your password in. Like I would question why I'm having to put my username and password in. And another thing that I've been seeing in the market a lot lately is is text messaging. So what they're yeah. doing is they're texting you from DHL, FedEx. Uh, Disney Plus, and then you go there and it says for you to put your username and password in for those websites. Again, a lot of people use the same password and all they're doing is phishing for that information. Nothing's going to happen at that moment, but They'll once you put your email and password and they have it, they may just be selling that data mm -hmm. or they may be hacking and getting into what you're going into. So again, 
uh, links are, 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 you're going to click on things. Just, just be weary when you're putting a username and password in, you know, if I picked up the phone and called you today and I asked you to give me your bank account, uh, information, you know, would you give it to me? Probably not. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I would keep your passwords very close to you. Um, change them often. Um, you know, again, MFA, I will tell you can protect against if you do click on something and you do put your password in, I've watched hackers go in, get into a person's email account, wait until that individual user is responding to a wire transfer or transferring of funds, reply back to the email from the email address that you think you're sending to. And then once that wire transfer is done, you're, you're in trouble. That money's gone. And by the time you report it to get it back, it's over. So again, some of it is policy. Make sure you're discussing mm -hmm. that with your accounting team on how wire transfers are done, multiple ways of verification and just picking up the phone, making a phone call, verifying information, verifying accounts is, is mission critical uh, when looking at some of those scenarios. So again, be very weary and cautious. You never, to, we get clients that message us daily. Hey, I got this today. What do you think? Let us look at it and verify prior to just doing something. You know, it doesn't take long. Uh, our average time to respond right now uh, for any service ticket is, is under a minute. So you're going to get an answer. You'll have an understanding. Don't, don't just click on something and go, I know we have some clients on here as well. Um, but again, I, I would, I would just be weary always. Right. And I would add to that, that you should have what we call a cyber uh, culture of cybersecurity. Um, and you could do that through having training, by doing things like if someone accidentally clicks on an email, they should be in an environment where they feel safe to report, hey, I made a mistake. Um, what is the saying that sugar attracts more flies <laughs> than vinegar? Not that you want flies, but you know, if someone, you, you want to mitigate damage. If someone has done something incorrectly, you want to mitigate damage. I'm not saying if someone clicks every day is clicking on a new email, you're going to have to do something about that. But if someone makes an honest mistake, one time, two times, you have to set that threshold. You you want to make sure they're comfortable reporting it so you can mitigate that damage. Absolutely. Yeah, you want them to be able to tell you that they actually did click on something because nine times out of 10, when they do click on something, they don't, something doesn't happen immediately. You know, right. So you don't want to build a culture of accountability where people are afraid to tell you that, mm -hmm. hey, I clicked on something. I mean, we look, we, we've had it here internally and we do a ton of education for people. So it, it, it happens, but you want them to, you would rather them tell you now rather than mm -hmm. let it sit. And we can't go do a scan and have a better understanding of where things are. Cause a lot of these things that are happening are happening behind the scenes mm -hmm. and most hackers. And when they get into your systems, they are going to let, let it sit for an average of like four to six months mm -hmm. because they're watching behaviors. They're watching your backups. They're corrupting your backups. They're watching mm -hmm. what tools that are out there that you're utilizing so they can manipulate those tools. Like these are smart people. They know how to get around some of these things. Um, so again, just, just be cautious. Well, Taylor and Sean, this has been great, but we have a few more questions, but I'm not sure how much more time. Um, we, we started a couple minutes late, but I think we still have a couple minutes to go. And I, I definitely want to get to these next two. Uh, Brian asked, what vulnerabilities do we have if, uh, if some employees use their personal phones to access MS365 for email? And I would think that uh, that same question would apply to, you know, some other work related yeah. programs uh, on their personal devices. Right. There are ways that um, I know my my company uses, lets us use our personal phones, but um, they have physically disabled. So I cannot send an email. I cannot copy information out of any corporate resources into a personal device. I can't copy it into notes. I can't copy it into a text message. I could only copy between those applications I use for work. So basically my chat app that I use for work, my email app I use for work, and the one web browser that is certified for work. There are ways to lock down your system like that. I don't know if you can speak more to the actual tech, Sean. Yeah, I mean, you have MDM solutions that are out there that are mobile device management that can help set some of those expectations. Um, look, it can get pricey. It all depends back down to risk. You know, mm -hmm. I, I will tell you, looking at the way um, your Microsoft accounts are set up and then MFA, again, another way to protect against it. 
um, in education, right? You, you got to educate your staff. You can't just set it and forget it. I, I would make it as part of your onboarding process uh, for all of your staff to be going through some form of cyber awareness training. Um, again, we offer that as part of our uh, as part of our protect package, the way that ongoing training is happening, uh, as well as us internally fishing your company to get you information to know who is clicking on things. And you'd always be surprised. It's always the CEO or the CFO or, or the cyber person or the cyber person <laughs> clicking on the items they shouldn't click on. So it's, it's, it's always interesting, you know, to see it. You know, I look back at some of these reports and I laugh, you know, but it's look, it's it's, it's common. They've gotten very good at, at being able to manipulate it. So I saw one question, you know, about turning off links. Look, you can turn links off in, in 365. The problem with that is now you're going to interrupt business when somebody does send you a link that mm -hmm. you do need. Yeah. Um, there is too much security that you can put in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I see a question here with many small businesses seeking the differentiation between innovation and technology or the security for certifications that we should look for or something that we can look for when considering the Internet of Things devices. Absolutely. There's tons of information out there. Mm -hmm. um, look, I would vet your vendors, ask them what their cyber policies are ask them what their incident response plans are. If your vendors do not have those things readily available to give to you, I would question allowing them access into your information. I mean, it, look, it, it's very, very important. You don't know how many people we talk to and they're like, oh yeah, we got a, we got a cyber guy, you know, um, or we got a, we got an IT guy. Look, there's nothing wrong with, with, with using a small IT vendor and having them out there. I think the big issue is that relies into that is, and, I, and I've been pushing within the state level to make it a license. Look, anybody can be do IT. We can start a new IT company tomorrow and not have any certification, anything, and go say we do IT. Again, but, but I, I can't get a plug put in my house without a licensed electrician, right? So again, it, it is that much of a risk. I, I would be cautious and question what certifications that are there. So, um, Natalie, I know you got to drop off. I know you got another one right behind it. Taylor, yeah. do you have any more questions? Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you so much for being here. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, we do have one more question and I, I think Sean can address that one. So awesome. uh, really, again, thank you so much. All right, uh, Sean, the, the last question I wanted to make sure we addressed here came from Dave, uh, I'm sorry, came from uh, Mr. Horn. Uh, how do you know how much protection and investment you need for your company? Uh, for example, our company uses a cloud-based CRM and OneDrive that we use to store uh, SSNs and customer information. Are we liable? Uh, great question. I get this question a lot. Absolutely, you are liable. You know, uh, I've had so many companies tell me, oh, well, all my information stored inside of some database that's cloud-based. Great, awesome. If they get into your computer, can they get into your systems that have that information? Therefore, you're liable. It's still your desktop machine sitting there. Uh, OneDrive, so many people tell me all the time, oh, I have OneDrive, I don't need backup. I don't need protection. Microsoft has more protection than, than anything. Yeah, but that information is still there. If I get your password, I can get into your OneDrive, I can get your information, and I can do whatever I want with it. Um, you know, backups are critical on a OneDrive application. A lot of people think because they have Office 365, they don't need backup. I will tell you, you do need backup on your 365 account. Microsoft does not back your systems up. So there's so many vulnerabilities that come in with that. You know, uh, a big one is just deleted information. You know, we run applications alongside 365. So like, say you have a disgruntled employee that just starts deleting information, then what? How do you get it back? You know, without having the proper setups and the proper backups, is that, is that information important for you? If it is, and I would 100% look at it from that perspective and have, and, 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 and again, these are all very inexpensive ways to protect your organization. You're, you're not talking huge dollars here. Um, look, it all have, has to sit down and look at what, it, what, is, what is the business willing to risk and tolerate. Uh, I know in the insurance business, 
you guys have to follow certain compliances in order to, to sell insurance. You have people's very private information uh, all the way down into financials. So um, again, it could be detrimental. So I would say uh, really it depends on how much business is out there and what is the risk to not have that information. That's really where I always look at it and weigh it out. You know, I have talked with clients that it really doesn't make sense for the have to have as much security as what we try to posture for them. Um, but there's different ways for us to create those packages in order to make it an affordable, you know, solution uh, for you in your business. So uh, definitely liable. So no, no one is liable for you. Uh, I would look at also your cyber policy to look at what those guidelines and stipulations are if something is to get breached and what happens. They, they are changing that on an annual basis. Uh, look, insurance companies are mitigating risk and with ransomware and it constantly happen. And that's why those policies are going up. I can typically tell just by asking a client what they pay for cyber insurance if they have the right policy. Cause I, I've had people give me a number and I'm like, okay, I can tell you now you're not covered. You think they're going to cover that amount of money. If something happens for the amount of money you're paying, you know, uh, if it's too good to be true, it's probably not. So I, I would, I would definitely look into that and review that uh, as a whole. I know we have some insurance providers on here. Again, if you're not uh, talking to that with your clients, there, are, there is so much opportunity in the market right now uh, for good insurance for companies because they, they really don't, they're, they're just not aware is all it is. Companies don't understand. It's a good conversation to have. Um, and it's a good way to go in and educate and, and help them understand. Again, I know a lot about it. I've had to do a ton of research on my own, lots of conversations, lots of questions, lots of webinars. So again, if you have questions, I'm more than happy to anything, answer anything. A lot of the people that are here today uh, know how to get in touch with me. So uh, again, thank you so much today for attending. We appreciate y'all being here. We hope you learned something today um, and we look forward to hearing from you if you need any help. Yeah, thank you everybody. Uh, we'll be sending out uh, slide decks here in just a little bit in case anybody else needs a copy of the presentation. Uh, if you're interested in getting a risk assessment scheduled, talking with our cybersecurity team, you can click the uh, button at the top of your screen or maybe at the bottom um, and we will be in touch with you. Thank you so much. Thank y'all so much. Thanks, Taylor. All right, bye-bye.